Hey everyone, this is Chris Ashley. It's really great to be back with you. Uh, sorry, it's been a moment since I did a video podcast. Um, as I explained in my last one, it's been a crazy time. My dog passed away just over six weeks ago now. My dad is still in hospice. Make sure my mic's working. <laughs> I've been flying back and forth from Chicago to California, uh, from my parents' house to my house. And it's just been a crazy time. Um, I also have a couple businesses that I'm running. So, you know, I've missed all of you and I love doing these videos. I'm glad to be doing one again. And honestly, like, I just wasn't really feeling that inspired. Like when you have so much going on, sometimes it's, it's hard to even gather your thoughts enough to know what to say. Right. Um, and it, you don't want to like force any of this, right. You want to, you want to, you want it to be really natural. So, so yeah, I'm back and I have things to say. So, you know, I've, I've been thinking about this theme of trying to control everything all day. Um, and so many of us go through life just trying to control everything, right? Like we have this like ice grip on things and like even just doing that motion, that like clenching, it just like all of your muscles tighten. There's all of this tension in your body. And that's how a lot of people go through life. And it's just because of fear right? They think that the world is a scary place out there. And if they could just control every single thing, at least everything that they possibly can, then it would be a little less scary. But here's the thing, you can't really control anything. You can control your thoughts. You can control emotions to some extent. Um, you can control the way you respond or react to things, but that's really it. And we, we come up with these big life circumstances that we're going to go through before we incarnate into this lifetime. And those are simply so that we can learn the lessons that we're meant to learn. And then we, we go through the things and we hit those big milestones. And besides that there's free will, but you can't really control a lot. Um, a lot of it's predestined and a lot of it, you know, you can to some extent control your reality with your thoughts, what you manifest, what you bring in, but like you can't control if you're going to get hit by a car tomorrow. Um, and I've been watching this happen with my mom. So like I said, my dad's in hospice and he's been really ill for two years now. Um, since getting COVID, he was one of the first people to get COVID. I think I talked about that in my past video. Um, he got it in like March of 2020 and it's just been this like downhill battle since then. He had uh, blood clots because of COVID. He got strokes because of it. He couldn't eat anymore. And it's just um, and he's ready to die. Like we have had so many conversations on life and death and, you know, he's so at peace with it. There's no depression. There's no anxiety. There's no fear. Like he's ready to go. He wants to see his brother. He wants to see his parents. He wants to see our dogs that have passed away and he's just ready. He's just, he's ready. And he's going out on his own terms. Like he could get a feeding tube and live longer. Not what he wants to do. And I respect that. Um, but my mom's having a really hard time with it. And, you know, I'm sure tons of people listening to this can understand where she's coming from. Like, I get it. I really do. And she has spent two years just fighting for him to stay alive, fighting for his life, doing everything she could possibly could to keep him alive. And she has all this tension built up. And I was talking to her about this today. And I was like, you know, he's ready to go. And she was like, I've been, I've been fighting for him for two years. And I said, yeah, and it's time to stop fighting. It's time to let it go. And here's the thing. The two of them have just been butting heads, right? There's so much tension between them because she is constantly nagging him to eat, to drink more, to do this, to do that. And he just wants to be left the hell alone. Like when I'm with him, we just watch movies. We talk, we talk about you know, his childhood, his teen years, his time in the army, his, like his buddies that have passed that I knew. And he has such a good time talking about all of that. And, you know, we watch our favorite movies and we laugh and we enjoy each other's company. And my mom is missing out on doing that. And she is so focused on trying to keep him alive that she's nagging him and it's creating stress for her and that's creating stress for him. And they're not enjoying each other's time and they're fighting. 
And he, he actually was thinking about checking himself into a hospital hospice. He's at home now in hospice, but into a hospital because, and he said to me, I don't want to spend the last few days of my life fighting with my wife. And that just broke my heart. I'm like, you don't want to go die in a hospital alone. Like you want to be here in bed with the dog next to you, with me here. Um, and he said, you know, I just want to die. Like, it doesn't matter where I am or how I go or anything. He's like, I'm just ready. So, you know, I'm like watching that situation and it's such a great metaphor for life, right? We miss out on all of these special moments that we could have because we are fighting so hard to control something that we were never even meant to control in the first place. Um, so yeah, it's interesting. And like watching this whole hospice journey with my dad is really interesting and he's been doing really well. Um, <laughs> I've, I've been having like a lot of crazy experiences and he's starting to as well. Um, so I've been having all of these deceased relatives come and visit me in my dreams. And I, the last, the last episode I posted was about shared death experiences. And I talked about how I had a shared death experience with my dog that was really profound and left a really big impact on me. And I've always been really intuitive in my dreams. Like anytime I dream about someone, they either like call me the next day, or there's like some big piece of news that they post online or something like they got married or had a baby or like something big happened. Um, and sometimes like people I haven't spoken to for years, I'll dream about them and then I'll like run into them the next day. So dreams have kind of been a way for me to tap in uh, which is interesting. Um, I like it. I like it a lot. And like soda, soda pop, my dog who just passed away has been visiting me in my dreams. And that's really special. I'm gonna turn my phone off. Oops. Um, but yeah, so my grandma, my grandma visited me in my dreams the other day and she, she was much younger than I've ever seen her looking. Um, she was the age that like, she probably was when my dad was growing up and she looked great. She was beaming. She was so happy. She was smiling. She was dressed up. She had a necklace on her. She had lipstick on her hair was all done and she was so happy. And I gave her a big hug and I just knew in the dream that she had come to take my dad. And then last night I dreamt about my dad's dad who I've, who I've never met. And it was really cool. There was this moment in the dream where we were standing looking at each other and he had this big smile on his face. And, you know, he was looking at me, his granddaughter, who he's never met. Right? And he said, you're so beautiful. Like, you know, I think about it. Like if you've, if you met a relative that you haven't, haven't ever met before and it's like, oh my God, look at you. It's you. Like, you're so beautiful in person, you know, whatever. And it was that kind of feeling. And he gave me this big hug and I said, and you're so handsome. And it was this really sweet moment. Um, and yeah, there's more to the dream that I won't get into, but it's, it's really interesting. Like these people are starting to visit me and usually they visit the patient that's dying, right? Like over 80% of hospice patients report seeing a past loved one, a past pet, um, a past friend, uh, Sometimes they'll see angels or spirit guides or some type of being that they're like, I know, I know them, but like, I don't know them from this life, but they're very familiar. And these entities, these people, these souls are coming to start to get them ready to transition to the other side of the veil. And they're, they're there to help them make that transition, to take them over. And they're kind of like, Hey, we're going to be here to guide you through this journey. You know, it's going to be a few days. Usually it happens within like a week of them passing. And there's some incredible accounts on so many books written about it all over online. Like you should go check them out if you're interested. Um, I've been reading this amazing shared death experience called At Heaven's Door that I really, really recommend. It's been providing me a lot of comfort, especially since I had that shared death experience with my dog. So, so yeah, and my dad, little things are starting to happen to him. He had what he called a hallucination. My mom called it a dream. I think it might've been a vision, but he saw two people. And then he said they were bright yellow and they were standing next to each other across his room and they were getting ready to race. <laughs> and uh, when I asked him what the people looked like, he was like, they were just lines. They were just lines that were bright yellow. And in my mind, I'm thinking like, oh, they're like light beings or something. 
And he actually climbed out of bed. This was two nights ago. And he he's like bedridden. And somehow he climbed out of bed and made it like crawled somehow to the other side of the room. And my mom woke me up at like two in the morning. She was like, get up, help me get bad dad back into bed. And um, he was like dead weight. It was really hard to get him back into bed. And he was like, at the time he was like, number 11 is racing. And my mom's like, you were dreaming, you were dreaming. And then when he told me about the two beings and how they looked just like two beams of light, I was like, oh, you said number 11 is racing. And he's like, did I say that? I was like, yeah. And all of a sudden it clicked and made sense. He was like, it was a hallucination. And I was like, I don't know. To me, it was like two beings coming down, made a light to just start to guide him. I don't know what the race part was about. (laughs) Um, So yeah, interesting things are happening. And I'm just so humbled to be along on this journey with him. And, you know, I, I just want to be there to support him no matter what he needs. Right. Um, like I said, my mom is so frantically thinking about the physical and I'm so, I mean, I think if you've been listening to my content for a while now, you know, that I'm so often like the ether and the ethereal and the metaphysical and, um, the spiritual plane, all of that. And I'm, I'm just there to guide him along the journey. And, you know, he's really open with me about all that kind of stuff and what he's thinking and about wanting to die and all of that, because he knows that I understand, you know, when he had COVID two years ago, he was in the ER, no ICU, sorry, the ICU. And the doctors told us that he had hours, days, if not hours left to live and to say our goodbyes. And we were saying goodbye on FaceTime and he was like, no, I'm just, I'm just so excited to go see my brother, Gene, and to see Casey and Frosty, two of our dogs who had passed away. And I was like, look, of course I want you to stay. like, I'll miss you like crazy, but I respect any decision you make. And he was like, thank you. That means a lot to me. And Meanwhile, my mom is frantically texting me, tell him you're pregnant so that it'll like make him fight harder to live. And like, those are the two differing uh, viewpoints that my mother and I have. And, you know, I'm, I, I feel bad for her because when this is all over and he's gone, I feel like regret is going to hit her and she's going to think about all of the fights and all of the unkind things that they said to each other and all the little exchanges um, and realize that like, she wasn't really there in the sense that he needed her to be at the end. And she wasn't really present and she wasn't really seeing him and she wasn't really uh, open to hearing about all these thoughts because, because of her own fear, right? Like she doesn't want to lose him. And, and I understand that. Like I really do. Um, God, losing your husband of 40 years, that would be really, really terrible, really scary. Um, But we're going to see each other again. You know, she'll see him again. I'm going to see him again. And I was talking to him about that too, not too long ago. He was like, you're the only one I'm going to (laughs) miss. I was like, well, or he's like, what do you say? He said, you're the only one I'm sad to leave. And I was like, don't be sad to leave me. Like, we're going to see each other again before you know it. And he was like, well, hopefully not too soon because you have a long life ahead of you. And I was like, "Ah, no, I think time is going to feel different over there. And he's like, it definitely is. And, you know, Shane, my husband and I talk about that with our dog a lot too. You know, we're going to see her again. And the other thing that's crazy, I wasn't even expecting to talk about this, but since losing Soda Pop, our dog, six and a half weeks ago, like my fear of death, like I didn't really have a fear of death, but now it's like, it's like gone, whatever tiny bit or whatever I had, whatever kind of fear, I guess in this lifetime, it wasn't fear of death. I haven't been afraid of death for a long, long, long time, but it was some sort of fear of needing to stay alive for a reason. And since she died, that reason has just totally gone away. Right. Like I used to, um, do a little mantra to make sure I got home safe every day. And I like, haven't really been doing that. And like, when I do it, it feels just out of habit and forced and it doesn't feel natural. And I think that was, again, me trying to control something because it it was all for her, right? Like I didn't want to 
die and leave her. Like I had this thing that I was taking care of my baby, my child. Um, but now it's like, well, well, if I die, I get to just go be with her and see her. And like, that's not so bad. Like, I think the only fear that's still there is like losing my husband, um, which would be really hard, but you know, it's the same thing though. Like we would see each other again as well. Um, but it's interesting. I almost feel like invincible now. Like it, it doesn't really matter. And I'm so, so, so hyper aware that we are just in this illusion, right? We're in this matrix. We're in this simulation. We're in this school, like whatever, however you want to like wrap your head around it. This isn't real life right now. We are not in real life. On the other side of the veil, that is real life. That is your true form. That is, that's the awake state, right? Right now we are in the dream state. Uh, there's this amazing Rumi quote that I love. Um, he says, death comes like dawn and you wake up laughing at what you thought was your grief. And that's kind of it. Like death is like waking up, right? It's waking up from this illusion. And it's weird being so hyper aware <laughs> that you're living in an illusion and like none of it fucking matters, but also like, you know, loving people and enjoying your time here. And it, it's these like two, two opposing forces where it's like, none of this matters. This isn't real. True life is on the other side of this. And then on the other hand, it's like, okay, but like, there's also a lot of beauty here and I want to have fun and I have my friends and my family and my husband and I want to like go explore and do things and also like trying to make a living and all of these things. And I, I kind of like, I kind of sometimes go back and, or just struggle a little bit with those two opposing views really. So I'm like, oh, I want to make a lot of money to, you know, be able to pay my bills or, you know, not make a lot of money, but pay, make money to pay my bills. And you know, to, to live a comfortable life so that like my future children can live a comfortable life. And on the other hand, it's like, yeah, but like none of this matters. And I just want to help people. And even if I don't get paid for that, I just want to help people. And so, you know, I think putting out these videos really and writing my book that's coming out, I have a book coming out called change your mind to change your reality. Um, and doing the life coach thing and owning the yoga business that I own. Um, the yoga business is sliding scale. So the most people possible get access to yoga. It's called Unite by Yoga if you want to check it out. We have classes online and outside, just a little plug. Um, but yeah, there's this like need to just like help humanity awaken, help people rise in consciousness, help our planet but also just knowing that everyone's on their own path and in the end they're going to learn what they need to learn and they're going to experience what they need to experience and none of it has to do with me like all you can really do here's the thing all you can really do is work on yourself everything else is part of the illusion right and i think about this all the time when i see people like trying to fight the man and like go to protests and like it's so wrapped up in current events or the biggest news story as of late or politics or whatever, because the way that you help heal the world, the way you help heal humanity is by first healing yourself. It all starts within. And if you can help yourself and heal yourself and learn and grow and rise in levels of consciousness, you will rise and you will lead by example and you will be able to give people a helping hand to lift you up to your place. And they're going to want to rise to meet you is the thing, right? You don't have to force it when you go out and try and force people. I mean, I'm sure all of you <laughs> have tried to like force someone to do something and had them really resist, like dig their heels in. And uh, of course they do, right? <laughs> um, because people want to do things on their own time. People want to think that it was their idea people don't like being told what to do. And if you rise and they see like, oh, wow, they're living with a lot of peace in their life. They're living with a lot of compassion and kindness and joy and happiness. Um, then they're going to, they're going to be like, ah, oh, 
I wonder what that whole spiritual thing is about. I wonder what they're doing. Maybe they'll come ask you. Maybe they'll just want to be in your, your energy, your presence. And even that can, you're a beacon. If you're listening to this, like you were put on this planet to be a beacon of love, a beacon of light. You don't even have to do anything, right? We're so focused on doing something. It's it, okay. It brings it back full circle. We're so focused on trying to control something. And it, it brings me back to a story about when my dog was passing away. So we had a vet come to help her make the transition in our home. And the way they do it is they give them a shot first. That's like part pain medicine, part, um, I don't know, like anti-anxiety pill, like it just calms them. And then when they give, they, they let you say goodbye. They let you like love on them. And then when you're ready, they'll give the final lethal injection. And the vet warned us, like, when I give this first shot, the pain meds hit first. And sometimes the dogs get anxious and then the calming kicks in and then they relax. And Soda had been laying down and sure enough, the, the vet gave her the shot and Soda kind of like jumped up a second later and sat up and started panting and looking around and like acting anxious. And like my heart started pounding and like, I have this motherly instinct to protect her. And I was like getting all worried and panicky. And I was like, Oh my God, is she okay? And like, my husband just like looked at me and maybe like put his hand on me and was like, you don't have to protect her anymore. And that was the most profound moment because it was like, yeah, I've been doing everything in my power to protect this sweet little being and keep her alive and love her and protect her. Now I'm getting all like teary eyed and I don't have to do that anymore. That's not my job anymore. My job in that moment was to make her feel loved and safe and peaceful and to, to let her know that it was okay to go and to let go myself. And that was such a powerful moment of realization where it was like, you don't have to protect her anymore. That's not your job anymore. As her mother, your job is to let her go. Uh, I didn't expect to cry. But I feel like that's what my mom needs my mom needs to come to that realization right now with my dad that it's not her job anymore to protect him or to keep him alive or to fight for him it's her job to be there for him all right i'm gonna end this now <laughs> i love you all my name is chris ashley i'm a life coach i'm a yoga teacher uh, i'm an author my book called change your mind to change your reality is coming out soon uh, my website is changeyourmindtochangeyourreality.com. If you head over there and sign up for my newsletter, you will get a free PDF guide sent to you to help you manifest your dream life and have a beautiful rest of your day. Thank you for listening as always.